Chicago, one of the great cities of the world. In the heart of the city is a great institution, Moody Bible Institute. And in the heart of this school is a file room with thousands of wonderful stories. This is one of them, the John Beekman story, the story of survivor number three. Here to tell you the story is the president of Moody Bible Institute, Dr. George Sweetie. It's an interesting thing how the sound of a beating heart gets our attention. It's very personal. For any one of us, if it stops, we're in trouble. The results are rather permanent. The sound you now hear comes from the heart of a man living on borrowed time, John Beekman. With the help of Elaine, John's wife and able assistant, he still leads a productive life. But according to medical science, John Beekman should have died many years ago. It just so happens that the three of us, John, Elaine and I, were classmates. Over the years, I have followed with great interest the miraculous story of their life. John, back in those days, were you aware of the seriousness of your heart condition? Yes. Early in life, my parents took me to a specialist. I was told to take it easy if I wanted to live very long. But I decided, back when I was a boy, that uh, even if I had certain limitations, I would make the best of my life. I happen to know that you did exactly that. Your file shows that while still in school, you wanted to go to the mission field. But with your heart the way it was, what made you decide to undertake such a difficult thing? Well, those were the days just prior to World War II. When I applied for service in the Army, they gave me a 4F on account of my heart. And I reasoned that 4F for the Army meant 4F for the mission field. But then uh, Elaine made a suggestion. You remember what that was? I certainly do. I suggested you see Dr. Titus Johnson, the school doctor, and see what he would say. Well, it wasn't going to cost me anything, so I went to see him. Of course, he detected my heart problem, but I asked him if he would advise missionary service for me. It seemed like a long time that I waited for his answer, but finally he said, John, if the Lord wants you on the mission field, he'll get you there. And if I were you, I would much rather spend 10 years of dedicated life among people who have not yet heard the gospel message than to stay here in the States and perhaps live a longer life ministering among people who have already heard the message many times. Well, that was all I needed to hear. From that point on, my whole orientation shifted toward the mission field. The jungles of southern Mexico would hardly seem the place for a man with a bad heart. No roads, no telephones, no hospitals, no doctors. Chiapas is somewhat the same shape, but a little larger than the state of Ohio. It has often been described as one of the most rugged, inaccessible areas on earth. Nevertheless, beneath those treetops down there, beneath that expanse of green foliage, Chiapas is home for almost a million people, mostly Indians. 14 tribes of Mayan descent speaking 15 different dialects. Also down there is poverty, disease, revenge, brutality, and witchcraft. This was the place John Beekman took his bride, his ailing heart, and his desire to serve the Lord. With his heart pounding from exertion and all but overcome by the fatigue that accompanies poor circulation, John made a solemn vow 
that neither the peril he had chosen to live with nor his personal discomfort would keep him from serving as best he could. This was his new home, Chole country. And it was here that he would find a needy people, suspicious, illiterate, poverty-stricken Indians who had so often been abused, mistreated, and taken advantage of that they trusted no one. Fear was the only thing they understood. And the village witch doctors took advantage of their ignorance to make their lives even more miserable. From the very beginning, John worked with a sense of urgency. Life expectancy was short. The job ahead was overwhelming. John had to learn an extremely difficult language. Illiterate people had to be taught to read and write, an overwhelming task. The great motivator for John was his firm conviction that the most important thing he could do for the Chol Indians was to give them, in their own language, the Bible, the Word of God. If he could accomplish this, or even a part of it, he would not only be making the most of what was left of his own life, he would be giving the Chols the greatest contribution humanly possible. Night after night, as he struggled with the complexities of patterns and sounds associated with language and speech, there were other sounds always in the background to test the strength of his commitment. His heart, of course, a reminder of time slipping by. The cries of Sharon, the Beekman's first child, which the Lord gave and the Lord took away. And the drums, pagan drums symbolizing the spiritual darkness surrounding the Chol Indians. In the daytime, Translation work often had to be set aside. Physical needs of the people demanded attention. The small, growing church needed to be nurtured and fed. Believers already there when the Beekmans arrived needed to be encouraged to continue their stand. As time went on, the body of believers grew, and as they learned to read and write, John found it necessary to set an example. He shared the gospel message with all who would listen. He prayed that the seed would fall on fertile ground, that the people would come to realize being a Christian was not only receiving God's greatest gift, but sharing it with others. And slowly it began to happen. The need to evangelize became a concern of the people. Individual Chol believers were responding to the call to become part of the ministry. And not only the men responded, but the women too. For John was not laboring alone. In spite of illness and the loss of their first child, most of the time Elaine was there working at his side. Teaching the women to read God's word was the key to Christian homes. Inevitably, as the mothers grew in the word, the change would affect their children. Hearts that are happy seek a way of expressing themselves, and often the children of the grateful believers came to the Beekmans bearing gifts. The Bible tells us that God loves a cheerful giver, and certainly the heart of our Lord must have gone out to these needy people as they gave of what little they had to express their thanks. The years slipped by and John did the best he could to keep up with increasing demands on his time and talents. Heart pains occurred more and more frequently. John tried to keep this to himself. The translation of the New Testament into Chol language had been completed by the Beekmans and their colleagues and was now being checked. Small groups of Christian homes grew into Christian villages, some of them bearing Christian names such as Jerusalem. And from these villages, the Chols themselves were witnessing to their neighboring tribe. Airstrips began to appear as mission aviation pilots helped to further evangelize the area. Christianity in Chol country was becoming a vibrant, living reality. But as its heartbeat grew stronger, 
another heartbeat began to fade. After eight miraculous years of service on the mission field, for John Beekman, time had run out. His strength was gone. The pain could no longer be denied, and he was rushed to a world-famous cardiologist in Mexico City. A number of tests were taken, and Dr. Demetrio Sodipoliaris, after studying the results, said to John, how you've walked the trails of Chiapas and lived this long is a mystery to me. And then the doctor explained to him that his aortic valve had never functioned properly. And this problem had caused other problems. His heart was greatly enlarged. His blood pressure was now dangerously high. He was suffering congestive heart failure. And within a short time, medication would no longer help. Humanly speaking, it was the end of the line. There was one slim chance for survival, and even that involved considerable risk. Dr. Charles Huffnagel at Georgetown University Hospital had developed a plastic valve which could partially correct the faulty aortic valve. Dr. Sodi Piaris was right. The basic problem was the aortic valve. John Beekman had aortic insufficiency, a leak in his aortic valve. At that time, this was a risky proposition. Of the four patients who had been operated upon previously, two had survived. The best we could offer John was a 50-50 proposition. A 50-50 proposition may not have sounded good to John, but it was all he had. Without hesitation, he took it. The operation was performed, and John became survivor number three. Dr. Huffnagel informed him that if he took it easy, he might have five more years. Take it easy? Not the Beekmans. They returned to the mission field, and five years later, John was interviewed by Dr. Erwin Moon of Moody Institute of Science. John, I hear a sort of a clicking noise. Yes, if I open my mouth and stop talking, you could probably hear it better. Listen. That's that little ball inside the valve which goes up and down with the palpitation of each heartbeat. I think I have a surprise for you, John. Listen to this. <laughs> well, what do you know? <laughs> you ever see something like that before? Yes, Dr. Huffnagel showed me this before the operation and afterwards. You didn't expect to see one down here? I surely Meekland, did not did expect to see one down here on the mission field. Well, <laughs> this is interesting. <laughs> Makes uh, a little bit more noise than mine. Well, John, what are your plans now for the future? Well, the Lord has given me a five-year extension on my life, counting from the time of the operation, which has been used in his service, and every bit of life that he gives me yet, I want to use and dedicate to his service, wherever it might be. And I'm ready and willing to serve in any capacity, in any place, as he points the way. Yes, the doctor had promised John five years if he would take it easy. Well, John had not taken it easy. If anything, he had accepted even more responsibility. He labored long hours with translators stationed throughout Mexico and Central America. He kept responding to the steady increase in the demands for his natural talents and his experience in this difficult work. In keeping with his vision of how someday the Choles would have their own Bible school and be ordained to preach, he shared the responsibility with missionaries of the Reformed Church for organizing such a school in Berea. And somehow he found time to be with and enjoy his growing family. In addition to Judy, who was away at school, the Beekmans now had Tom and Gary. Instead of taking it easy, John looked and acted like a man with a new lease on life. In fact, the record shows that God extended John's ministry 18 years before he faced another crisis with his heart. Nothing could more accurately symbolize those years than a mosaic of John's work with translators. That work never stopped. And nothing could better represent his delicate physical condition than the ever-present clicking of that plastic valve in his heart. Even so, notable things were to happen to John between 1960 and 1973. 
He was appointed translation coordinator for the entire Wycliffe outreach. He became supervisor of the new translation center north of Mexico City. He instigated workshops which were highly praised. He received the MBI Alumnus of the Year Award. In 1964, John was told the plastic valve in his heart was no longer adequate. A new valve was needed. He was also told that the operation could not be performed. He would never live through it. A strict diet, medication, and rest was the only formula for his survival. He followed the diet. He took his medication, but he simply could not rest. That would have to come later when the Lord called him home to heaven. In the meantime, there was much to be done. In 1967, he stepped up the pace to become more involved than ever with holding translation workshops throughout Latin America. That same year, the official report showed that within 24 months, under John's supervision, 317 translators working in 231 languages had received consultation help. In 1968, his duties turned him into a world traveler. But in 1972, in Africa, as a result of receiving medication for malaria, John Beekman's all-out efforts were brought abruptly to a halt. His heartbeat lost its pattern. At times it would falter, even stop, then start again. At other times it would beat so rapidly that measuring his pulse was impossible. And again in Mexico, Dr. Sodi Pagliaris ordered him to the hospital. And again, medication quieted the situation, stabilizing the heartbeat temporarily. But also again, our missionary with the ticking heart found himself on a collision course with the end of the road. He moved with his wife Elaine to a new linguistic center in Dallas, Texas. His strength was gone but he forced himself to do what he could. He stuck to a rigid diet. He rested whenever possible, but the old arrhythmia, the irregular heartbeat returned. His constant companions were weakness, nausea, dizziness, and pain. Inquiries concerning heart surgeons brought to John's attention the name of Dr. Michael DeBakey in the neighboring city of Houston. Surgical techniques had now advanced. The name of Dr. DeBakey commanded worldwide respect. Surgery was scheduled. The operation was performed. John's recovery was slow and at times very uncertain. But after 18 days, he was released from the hospital and returned to his home at the Linguistic Center in Dallas. Another miracle was in the making. God was not yet ready to call his dedicated servant home. Over a period of time, as strength returned, and with the help of his wife Elaine, John was once again able to shoulder some of the many responsibilities that went with his job for Wycliffe Bible translators. Always there were those going and coming from the mission field, fellow workers who needed consultation and more training. There were classes to teach, letters to write, workshops to set up, books to author. If John could share his experiences and talents on the printed page, he could greatly magnify his ministry. So as he was able, he continued to serve, not in his own strength, but in the strength that daily God was giving him. As he worked recalling experiences of bygone days, Occasionally he would reminisce. He thought of his mother, who frequently wrote of his determination to serve God. As he yielded to the Savior's call, he was willing to sacrifice and give of his all. As he went to the jungles, a forsaken land, he was always confident of the Lord's strong hand. The memory of his mother's poem reminded John of Chiapas. Reports from the field indicated that the Choles had continued to grow in the Lord. But how wonderful it would be if only he could go and make a personal observation. Similar thoughts occurred to Elaine as she worked along beside him. Many years had passed since the Beekmans were stationed in Chole country, and it was only natural for them to wonder 
how the seed they had planted was growing. It came as a total surprise to John and Elaine when recently it was possible for them to return to southern Mexico. With the cooperation of Mission Aviation Fellowship, these veterans of the farm field were flown to the exact spot where it all began, Amada Nervo. John was asked how he felt as the plane started to lose altitude in preparation for the landing. What was going through his mind when the pilot lowered the flaps and made his approach to that old but familiar runway on the ground? This was really an exciting homecoming for Elaine and myself. I could actually feel my old ticker increase its pace. I began to reflect on the past and how God had directed and blessed my life from the very beginning. When we first went there, there were approximately 800 believers. Now there are over 12,000 and the work of the church is still growing. Here they come. Lots of young faces there. Germanio! Germanio! Watch it, Lawilan! Do I get out there? Hermano, cuchuletio. Cuchuletio, que va a ir. When we left the plane to begin greeting them, we were moved with the privilege of talking with some of the old friends, and it was just a real joy to have this opportunity. Well, that was quite exciting, but it was a strange feeling, too. All these women, and they looked like the women I'd first seen there, but they were all the children of those women. Are these the two oldest of the brothers here that, that you remember as being the oldest? This fella is about 80. This fella is about 70. Uh -huh. This fella is the one from Scholipat who first introduced the gospel in Bachajon country. Praise the Lord. Bernabel Lopez. That was a name John would never forget. As he continued to talk, to smile, even to laugh, his mind raced back over the years. Bernabel, Spanish for Barnabas, was a man rightly named. Like the Barnabas of old, Bernabel was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and of faith a man whose face was deeply scarred as a direct result of his witnessing, a man who had had a shotgun placed in his stomach and the trigger pulled, but who had survived because God intervened. The powder was wet. These things had happened to Bernabel as he went out to win others to Christ. No, John would never forget that name. And so it was that as John and Elaine left the airstrip, and walked up the hill to the church, memories of years gone by crowded in upon their thinking. Elaine noticed that the women were healthier, happier. The same thing was true of the children, who seemed to have a different role with their families, a more important role. The big stone school buildings were not there in those earlier years. The change was full of meaning. <laughs> the greeting at the church, the official greeting, was full of Christian love and compassion. And again, there were names and faces that brought back to life old memories. For the most part, these elders of the church were boys when the Beekmans had last seen them. There was much fun and laughing as John tried to place them in the families he once knew so well. But here and there were faces he would never forget, such as Nicholas Boskis. Faithful Nicholas, who as a young man had helped more than anyone else with the early translation work. Nicholas was the nephew of a witch doctor, 
As a boy, he had been offered to the spirit of the cave and the seven spirits of the earth. But Nicholas chose to become a child of God. He will tell you that the spirits of the earth mean nothing to him. The only spirit that matters in his life is the Holy Spirit of God. To the grateful Choles who had gathered here to pay their respects, the Beekmans had simply come home. The mud hut where they had learned the language, taught the people to read, and lived among the Indians was no longer standing. But the floor of their old home brought to mind the placement of the furniture and incidents of the past. Uh, you're standing on the refrigerator. <laughs> Is that where it was? Yeah. Uh, you put in the water there yeah. so that I could have running water. And mm -hmm. this is where we had the steps going upstairs. That's right, went right over the corner. That's mm -hmm. where Judy fell down. Then we have an easy chair back we, here. That easy chair that's down and hangs. Is that <laughs> right? right there. On this very spot, before there was any cement floor or mud hut, before he knew how to speak Chol or even Spanish, John had stood here with the leaders of the village and prayed. Speaking in English, he had asked God to bless this piece of land and to bring the enlightenment of the scriptures to the entire Chol area. With a battery light by it. What John and Elaine did not realize until this oh, visit was that after that prayer meeting those many years ago, the Chol leaders met again by themselves, and they too had asked God to bless them with his word. <laughs> In the Bible, singing is symbolic of joy. In the book of Isaiah, we read, where there is no joy, there is no song. To hear the Chols sing held a special meaning for John. Before these people accepted Christ, they were never known to sing. After becoming Christians, the believers in Chol country were called the singers. Their joy had given birth to a new mode of expression. Because of the different dialects that oftentimes are represented in a church gathering, the believers pray aloud, each in his own language. This too was representative of a newly found freedom in worship. The timidity, the shyness, the hesitancy, all part of a lack of self-confidence were gradually disappearing. The Choles were gaining dignity as a people. To the visiting missionary, it was as though the miracle he had helped to start was blossoming before his very eyes. When we arrived among the Choles, back some 28 years, they were at the bottom end of a long descent into oblivion, dropouts of time, trapped in a dead end of decadence, disease, and debt. What a dramatic change the initial impact of the gospel had brought. La Cueva was the next village to be visited by the Beekmans. It was so named because in the area is a large cave where the witch doctors used to meet. Special services were held to worship the so-called spirit of the cave and the spirits of the earth. Today, the entire village is Christian. To reach the church, John had to resort to an old but familiar means of transportation. The village is on a hill, and I sat leisurely on the back of the mule and arrived in good shape. The believers have built a beautiful church at the highest point of the village, symbolizing perhaps the power of the word over the darkness of Satan. In every village, in every church, John and Elaine were asked to participate in the service. Of course, there was great joy in these moments of fellowship. But there was also the need for serious reflection. At this particular gathering, 
John spoke of Mateo Vasquez, now with the Lord. He reminded the people of how Mateo was the one who fearlessly took the gospel to the village of Carranza. He was chased with machetes. He was shot at. Seven of the men who tried to kill him are believers now, and three of the seven are elders in the church at Carranza. The neighboring villages of Francisco Madero and Jerusalem were next to be visited. The people here were dressed differently. Roads have been introduced to the area, and with the roads, the inevitable shirts and dresses from the looms of the cities. As they thought about it, John and Elaine were pleased with what they saw. The Christians were making a wholesome departure from old paternalistic patterns of protecting tribal groups from outside influence. There was no cultural insecurity here. These people were prepared to take advantage of the good things and leave alone the bad. What the Beekmans were seeing was not as quaint as it used to be, but it certainly was a healthier, happier group of people than existed those 28 years ago. From Francisco Madero, the trail to Jerusalem includes a river crossing. John remembered the many times he had crossed the river by foot or by canoe. He remembered the time when there were no shoes among the Indians and how the first shoes were bought by a chol believer. He also remembered how a woman would not have dared to venture from her village on an excursion such as this. Uh -huh. He remembered these things and a song was in his heart. <laughs> In Jerusalem, there was another song, a song of welcome. In Jerusalem, as in each of the villages, old friendships were renewed. New friendships were made. There was a memorial service, and there was prayer and exhortation. But as the Beekmans traveled up the river to Tortuguera, the witness and song from their beloved Chol Indians stayed with them, becoming part of a memory they would keep forever. For the Beekmans, the journey was drawing to a close. There was this village, then back to the base at Berea, then home. As they had done from the beginning, they continued to assess, to evaluate. What was the total impact of the Word of God on these Chol Indians? Certainly there was the warmth of Christian love. Joy was expressed in ever so many ways. Doing away with drink had done away with brutality. Wives were no longer beaten, children no longer cowed in fear, all of which is to be expected when lives are lived according to God's word. But there was another observation yet to be made, a very important one. What were these people doing with the word of God? Were they still sharing it with others? And how was this being done? Back in Berea, John got part of the answers he talked with his old friend Greg, Gregorio Lopez Cruz. Greg had an interesting history. He had run away from home as a boy. He had tried the pleasures of the world and found them lacking. He returned to Amada Nervo, accepted Christ, and became a totally different person. When the Beekmans moved to Berea, Greg moved too and became John's faithful assistant. Today, Greg is an elder in the church at Berea and a visiting elder in the village of Tortuguera. It was through Greg that John got the thrilling account of how, with their own hands, the believers support the Lord's work. From their earnings, they take a tenth and set it aside. That tenth comes out of whatever they have. If they have ten turkeys, 
one of the turkeys is marked as Thai. The Choles have embraced the principles of Christian giving from the Word of God. By our standards, they live in poverty. Their house is a hut. Their diet is simple, but there's never any reluctance about their giving. They give out of what they have with joy. And what is true of Greg and his family is true of the Christian community. Coffee is the main cash crop for the area, and times have changed. The Indians now own land. They grow their own coffee. When the berries are ripe, they are picked, hand-hauled, and spread out in the sun to dry. From this supply, a tenth is taken out. In Amada Nervo, the beans are taken by the elders of the church to the cement floor where the Beekmans once lived. There the tithe is dedicated to the Lord. John felt he had some of the answers. Yes, the Choles were still evangelistic. Yes, the funds for that evangelistic effort were coming from the faithful tithing of believers. But what about the pastor's salaries and the other financial needs of the church? One last visit provided answers to these questions. A visit with Hank Steginga, one of the Reformed Church missionaries still working with the Indians. I think it's remarkable, Hank, the way uh, so many men have been trained here through the Bible school setup. And it's been uh, really a privilege to see the pastors and meet some of the new obreros. I'm wondering, are these men uh, paid partially or somewhat from the states? Oh, no, John. Uh, that's one of the interesting parts of the work of the church here. Uh, each of these pastors is completely supported by the people that he serves. So they, from their offerings, take care of all of these expenses? Entirely. Yeah, that's great. As John and Elaine winged their way homeward, they did so with happy hearts. Chole country would never again be the same as they first found it. The word of God in the language of the people, coupled with their ability to read it, was the key to the miraculous transformation. It was basic to the spread of the gospel. It gave authority to the verbal witness of the men as they traveled over the mountains. And today, the purity of the local church is based squarely on the fact that the Chol Indians can read and understand the scriptures in their own language.